editorial board, editorial board that get elected. There's these sort of twice annual meetings that I'll talk a bit about later. Um, and then phone conferences amongst the editors just to keep on top of things. And then, you know, this idea that you only adopt changes to the specification if there are two or more applications that implement support for that change and are able to exchange descriptions between those tools. Just to follow that standard. And associated with CML, there's the P-cell ontology, uh, kinetic simulation algorithm ontology. So when you're defining what you want to do with a model, um, you need some unambiguous way to say what you're doing to it. Um, so the P-cell defines the different algorithms, simulation algorithms you might want to use, and the parameters for those algorithms in a sort of unambiguous way. And that's a sort of hierarchy of terms, so you can have very specific integrators. Um, and then if your tool reads that and says, well, I don't support that integrator, but I support this one, which I know is similar to that, so I can try and use it and hopefully things will work. Or otherwise know that it can't use it. Um, can I recreate that simulation pretty much. So CML. Um, Basically, you take a model, you take a simulation, and you combine those to do a task. And then from that task, you get some outputs, and so you can specify um, how to manipulate those outputs. So in any of these, um, you can define, you know, so you can link the model in the repository, say some changes that you want to make to that model, um, and say what you want to simulate. And at least the sellers, um, the data generators that you are creating are taking the outputs from your simulation tasks and then either combining them or just passing them straight through to create either reports or graphs. The box is a good <coughs> Availability. Um, so this is CML level 1 and version 1. Came out in March 25, 2011. And basically, it lets you encode descriptions of simulation experiments at a simple time course. Um, so just straight, you know, load this model, do this, or run it through this algorithm from you know zero to hundred, whatever. Um, and so this version of CML pretty much, I think, can capture most of what Alan was talking about this morning. Um, we're hoping for currently do. And of course, you can do the same sort of uh, policy thing against the NSA. So then in CML level 1, version 2, um, we added this notion of repeated tasks. So now you can have your model, your simulation, but you can say through this task however many times. You can change things as you go during the simulation, um, depending on either constant parameters or other um, sort of variables in the model. Um, and so one thing that happens, um, you can describe sort of very complicated tasks to perform now, but essentially the data generators went to touch. And so it's not very clear how you address some of the results of your repeated tasks. So now you can start to do things like parameter scans, um, sort of repeated stochastic models, changing the random to E or something. Um, you know, so they run a simulation, do some intervention, reset it, things like that. So you can essentially build up sort of arbitrary complex simulation experiments based on underlying other building problems. And so that was CML one version two, uh, which came out of End of 2013. <laughs> so that's the, the current sort of fixed version of the spec. Um, there's a few different libraries um, that support working with the CML format. And one of the original ones is called CML, the .NET um, tool, and it's got a whole suite of, of uh, supporting utilities. The C version of that is fairly new, but supports sort of the latest developments in CML. 
on the other side of the ocean and a sea on the way to Japanese. So now there's a range of applications um, that support CML, so you can in theory exchange simulation experiments between any of these. Um, and notably, this web tools um, service would work with Frank, who um, wrote that based on the .NET libraries um, to support CML. So some of the models in the repository you see um, screenshots from those, and we can upload them to the website and run the simulation. And so, because this is a come from the SPML world, um, the way you add extensions um, to CML is through what they call an annotation element, which basically says here's some extra information. Um, you may or may not understand it. Um, and so, um, some of the things you can commonly do um, in SPML models is they don't have explicit variables for everything. So if you need to address those, you can use these annotations. And there's some sort of standard annotations to find in the spec for specific things like time. Um, and you can also do some of some sort of enhanced output type things by encoding full specific information um, in these annotations. And the way um, so this tool support goes is so a tool will generally introduce something in an annotation block, and then if that becomes useful for more than one tool, they start to discuss it, standardize it, and then that becomes a feature in a later version. So where are things now? So the big change in the next version of CML is the introduction of data. So you want to be able to use data from some source in your task in the model. So either defining a model variable to be controlled by some experimental data or simulation data, um, or using some data in your post-processing simulation results. Um, and then social media through to the output of us. Um, so that's the sort of main thing that's missing from the current version. And I think this is pretty much done. The spec just needs to be finalized and fixed. So in CML level 1 version 3, when you're linking data and all the linkages to data is done through this other format called numeral, numerical markup language, which I'll talk a little bit about later. Um, and that sort of provides a standard interface for the way CML will talk to data. Um, and then underneath your numeral could be talking to any other sort of data format. Um, so yeah, there's one prototype implementation that supports this. Um, and looking at the sort of task parameter estimation as a specific task that uses data. It's a very common that a lot of tools support and would like to do. That's not relevant. Um, so yeah, there's the people that Currently, I'm a scientist from last year, so it's changed a little bit now. Um, I am currently an editor, um, so if you have any further questions, you can talk to me, and I'm happy to help. Um, the biomodeling team does a lot of work supporting CML um, and the sort of background website and stuff. Um, so, that is the end of my talk. Any Um, so I use the C++ of CML, and so it basically uses the to provide the method now presentation. So when when you manipulate your output um, or change your input parameters, you can specify mathematical expressions based on the variables in the model. Um, so that library uses the uh, mathematical capabilities from the female 
um, to do that. They saw in the most recent version of the best technology being a big update to the map and stuff. And there has been talk about separating that out to a separate label. Uh, I mean, I don't find it a huge inconvenience to link against the best we know. But yeah, there, there is talk about separating that out. So, um, so the, the fixed parameters were folded into that description. Um, is that true? Uh, on the seven mile ground, you have a protocol that you're, you're running, which you also have that fixed parameters in it in one of the later versions. Um, um, what was the discussion about including that in versus breaking the fixed parameters out? Exactly. What do you mean by fixed parameters? Well, it's on one of the screens you said you had. Um, uh, yeah, parameters. So wow. simulation of parameters, right? So I mean, I don't know if those are. Is that are those fixed parameters or are those parameters defined in the protocol? Maybe that's my question. Yes. Yeah, so this is the idea that you the way you are repeating tasks could depend on some new parameters that aren't in the model. So the fixed parameters would still reside in the model. No. So these are now in your set of out. Um, so if you say, you know, I want to run this thing over and over until you know, X is greater than 10, that 10 would be a parameter in the city. So it's not like I have this model and now I, it's, it's parameterized for a rat and now I want to actually change the fixed parameters to be a pig. That would still reside in a different instance oh, of the model. Okay, so. So that's one way to do it, but you can also just in an any version set it up and say use this model, but change x to 10, y to 3, and make those sorts of substitutions. So currently, you could set it up as one big document. All those changes to change it from a rat, so they would be set it up. Was there a discussion about having that as a separate? You may have separate sets of fixed parameters and separate protocols, right? You could run an experiment, a simulated experiment on a pig, and you can also do it on a rat. Yeah, so essentially in LML, the, the separation is already there between the mathematical model and the parameters. Um, Nicola Linnebeer likes to talk about parameter in mm -hmm. something where you now have a separate way to define those parameters. Um, How do you see um, stochastic simulation in relationship with CDM? Do you see that there's it's a setting up community when we thinking about specific support for um, multiple runs using proper distribution finds around the run? Yeah, so so a lot of the means we are doing a repeated task, but you have you know probability distribution that you want to resample each time you run through that loop. Um, it's discussed a lot. Um, okay. so, so there's no you know there's no need for setting up itself to define anything to do with that process that's just up to the user. So there's the so simulation specific if you're running a so I guess it's in motion simulation stuff. But if you want to say control the, the seeds or something, you can set an L if you can. Um, so when you specify the algorithm you want to use, maybe that has some parameters for that. Um, the thing that's often discussed is do you want this exact graph every time you run? And most people will say yes. But there's a lot of work with the sort of use of probability distributions in SPML itself. And so, what's in CML, what's in model, is not quite so clear. But yeah, it's a definite thing, more and more that sort of what behavior is what we need to cope with this.
I quite like the um, adopt the new spec to applications support it and can talk to each other. I think that's something we should think about. It's still an version. Yeah, so the, the question then becomes what are two different tools? So two different tools using the same underlying library. Are they different enough? Um, so historically it hasn't been quite so easy to get sort of level of support. So it would be ideal to get because you want to demonstrate that you can take this and exchange it with this and get the same. So something to work towards. And the um, sort of combined umbrella slowly deciding on best practices and stuff. That's something that's really common. Thank you. Now we'll move on to And, and uh, together with uh, Chris, we're, we're uh, looking into using Build Another Point Five to interchange models and things. Uh, um, and um, so, why are we doing this? Um, we identified um, last year that the uh, uh, model interchange between Iron and Zinc, the two parts of Open Zinc, is the greatest user issue uh, for our software. And um, in analyzing that, we, we both uh, determined that field of model, using field of model point 0.5 would be the most appropriate technology um, to interchange our models. And the reason for that, it was already partially implemented on both sides. Um, it's capable of representing the kind of field templates that are used in, in describing fields in iron and what we're planning to use in zinc. So that, that's sort of um, a future looking uh, uh, representation of the model. Um, it, it already deals with um, the efficient separation of the high-level description of the fields from the bulk data. And we can put the bulk data around. You can put it in line in the same file, but that tends to crowd out for a larger model from the, the semantic rich part from the bulk data. But you can also put it in separate text files or in um, hierarchical data format, um, HF5. And so uh, uh, because of this, um, the, the way it works, you can um, pass the high-level description of your fields and then when you're ready and on demand, go and take out parts of the, of the bulk data, so field parameters and connectivity and all that kind of stuff. And um, it's also designed to be extensible without breaking compatibility. And what, what that means is that uh, just by putting together the, the field of model constructs, you can describe something new, but it's, it's, if it's legal, the field of model can be loaded in, and then the, the, the recipient application can still read the bits it's able to read. But it, does, it can ignore the bits that it doesn't able to cope with. And that's um, in contrast to, to trying to uh, work with various old file formats where you add something new and they can't recognize it and it's an open. So, um, QML.5 was released actually several years ago, and um, we just haven't really used it um, in anger. We've, we've actually worked very hard on, on coming up with new things beyond QML.5. It's a good idea to, to push through with this approach just to uh, really learn the bits that it can't deal with and get us to focus on what's, what's required. So, Phil, I'll give you a, a, about three slides giving you the overview of what it does. Um, it's um, being a field description language, you, you have to talk about sets. You're not just dealing with not parameters for a single point. So, you have to be able to describe. Uh, discrete sets, what we call an ensemble in, in its terminology. So, for example, the nodes, the red points over there, so 
nodes numbers on S16, you can define continuous status such as the 3D coordinate system that would be activated 1, 2, 3. And you can define, um, and then I might add that um, the, the, um, this ensemble is also used to index the components of, of that multi dimensional space. And the, the third um, main type is a mesh, um, which is really a hybrid of the two. It's a set of discrete entities, each of one which has an associated chart, a, a, a in dimensional coordinate system, which is just a, a, a variant of this one here. But we, we are able to use a, a map to change the shape of those charts. So, for, for example, this cube is, um, is the region of a, of a, of a tree space, and like that, within zero is greater than equal to zero, is greater than equal to one. So, it's this parameter space, obviously, that you can to all the other parts. And there is also the linear type. So, these are the building blocks of, of declaring spaces. Um, but they're, they're called types, not domains like we might expect in fields. Um, this is just a, a field of malpoipism. Um, uh, but um, then it comes to actually uh, to using these. How do we use them? We have another main type of object type to evaluate And these are entities that produce a value of a type. And it's typically a function of some arguments. So the, the first type of object so all these are the types of evaluators you can have. An argument is, is a de de declaration of here is a value of a type. And so you use that at, at the start of an evaluation pipeline. You say here is a value in the mesh location, in, in the mesh type. And, and that means that you have to supply a location in the mesh, and then you can use other evaluators to define functions in terms of that. So, so those are the starting points. The other kind of starting point is that we can map uh, to parameters. Parameters are indexed by those ensemble sets. So you can have one, two, three dimensional uh, sparse or dense um, arrays. And as I mentioned before, the activation of the arrays described in the, in the XML that can be stored elsewhere in, in, um, uh, in external resources. Uh, because the, the uh, mechanism for defining parameters in that way was a bit over the top for just defining a single constant. A single constant evaluated was added by a uh, validation, and uh, that's pretty useful when I've started to use it. To use it. Now, the next three here are all doing function application. They're saying apply this evaluator, and, but possibly, or, or, or several evaluators, but possibly find its arguments to be my other evaluator. And I'll, I'll give you an example later, but it really is it's just a way of invoking some functionality and adapting it to, to how you want to use it. The difference between them is this is just a single application of another function. This one is true. In an element, for example, in this one here, I want a different function in each element. So that, that's a piecewise evaluation. And an aggregate is where I may want a different function for each component of the field. So like I'm making a vector. Now, it's separate per component of functions. And there's one final type of evaluator. So, I mentioned that um, a finding is how you adapt these, um, these uh, evaluators. The external evaluator is a way of declaring a function that isn't part of the language. You just get the name and it ends up being a URL. Um, uh, so, under uh, rule slash QML.5, library that there are a bunch of external evaluators. That represent a greed matrix function to know about that. So, but anyone can define an external evaluator in their, in their field. Learning. Well, as long as today, when they're rereading it, or, or a separate uh, recipient application recognizes it for what it is, then, then that's a way of, of communicating more advanced functionality. So, I, I just mentioned uh, the library, um, field of compliance imports, which, um, unlike an import and sell model, it really maps the, the name of well, the object available locally. It doesn't map a new instance of it. So um, it, it, it just, if for example, I had a, um, um, an evaluator in, in another um, document, if I bring it in, I'm referring to the same evaluator in terms of the same arguments. Um, so there's a subtle difference, and it, it, it comes into play, and I guess it's a bit more advanced than I can explain how the difference comes about. So the standard library defines uh, standard continuous types of real numbers, um, some, some grouping of coordinate system types. Uh, 
some continuous uh, types that represent the, the, the element charts and the uh, on which basis functions and, um, and shape um, the only way this is defined. And we have a whole bunch of basis functions. Now, we don't actually describe the math silly. If we just document them and say that the one that's called um, trilinear Lagrange does the, the trilinear Lagrange in this way. And, and uh, at some point in the future, we, we, we can uh, add that in some other way. So, this is what kind of example of how it works. Um, Import from the library the real, the, the, the 3D coordinates, and a um, a 3D coordinate uh, item here. I define a set of nodes on one hand, define an argument that will give me a node, and then I declare um, I here, here is a, a, a data source. So this is something additional. In, in the in the serialization, you have to say where the numbers are. That, that's a sign specific data, but it doesn't make it a generator or a time. But when we're making a parameter evaluator here that's producing a real number, um, and the name of this is no coordinates, and its data source is this stuff here. <coughs> I'm indexing it by the no value and by the current value. So I'm getting the eight nodes, three, but uh, three coordinates. So these are, these are the coordinates of the little corners of the cube. So um, I won't do too much of this stuff, but just, just a quickly go over how do I do some of the more advanced things. I want to do the trading or interpolation over a few. I have to um, import trading basis parameters and I can all these things that are defined in the library. I need to define the connectivity of, of my mesh. So I haven't uh, defined the mesh here, but suppose I have a mesh defined called mesh 3D. I'm defining a parameter set called mesh 3D connectivity 1 that gives me nodes. It's indexed by which element I'm in and which trilinear component in it. So there's eight um, eight for each eight nodes listed for each element. So this is just a, a standard um, local to global um, map that, that's used in the five elements representation. So it's very easy for a cube, one to eight. So now if I want to do an interpolation across there, I have to declare and this, and this one is actually defining a template. For interpolation. I don't have the parameters yet. All I'm saying here is that I'm promising no, the simple nodes parameters that gives me a 1D real a real value in terms of nodes. So it's a function of nodes that gives me real numbers. And then down here, I'm aggregating uh, with an aggregate evaluator to produce all the parameters that are needed for trying your interpolation. That's eight parameters that are needed there. So here I want to apply no parameters, which is giving me my uh, the, the real numbers I want in terms of those, and I'm indexing by um, here I'm, I'm I'm just aggregating over the components of these parameters, that's pretty minor. But the interesting bit here is I'm saying for the nodes argument that I defined on the previous page, bind it to my mesh, bind my mesh to one into it. So it, it actually goes uh, and knows how to do the lookup. The indirection of local to local. So this thing promises eight values for each element. And then down uh, here we can interpolate by applying the trilinear basis, finding the um, uh, so the, um, the, the the chart uh, that's the trilinear basis is defined on the coordinates of the, in, in your 3D element. We're going to bind it to the, the, the chart for my mesh. And I'm also binding the arguments in there. So that's what you need to invoke the basis function. So I don't want to give you more detail about, about it, but I just want to give you in a nutshell what's involved in there. So all those things I just described are, are, are the low level uh, objects that are used to make a uh, file or model. But this permits an enormous amount of generality that most software actually has. Um, so now, you, you have the same issues in Cellwell. You, you can describe something that with some mathematics, and, and the recipient software may not be able to, to parse it. So you end up wanting to have a, a kind of secondary specification. And, and because we're actually both working on essentially the same larger uh, package, we, we, we agree on this open CMOS field of our pattern. And um, I'll just go through some of the things we, we, we do. We just um, expect there to be some nodes defined, um, a, a mesh. And, and because we often use the weak term interpolation, we, we do fairly six derivatives and, and versions and, and, and use those. Um, but 
the more interesting bit is that um, in, in, the, in the matter of, of open things iron, we describe scalar field templates. So what that means is a, um, a template for defining a, a, a scalar single value field over a whole mesh um, by piecewise application of element field template. And an element field template is a recipe for how you interpolate and map parameters over a single element. So it's saying, how do I get parameters from, say, global nodes or per element classes, or however I'm doing it, and what basics I'm bringing in, and, and what scaling I'm using to do that. So, so those things are, um, Fuel of Five already allows you to do that definitions and makes them um, quite reusable. Um, so, um, the element, um, what's feeding into the element um, field template is the parameter mapping. So we we uh, we uh, define it in terms of node connect connectivity when it's nodally interpolated, and we define it in terms of an unknown loss argument, like a the degrees of freedom. So the parameters that were feeding into the template were unknown at the time. That's what makes the template. And similarly, if, you, if you're going to do the meat type models and you want scale factors, you can define a template that does not have any scale factors yet, but you can you, you can define a template that it's fixed. So when you want to use that field. You have to go and find in something that will give me the degrees of freedom for, for that field, and then I have a new field that has the context and some um, parameters for it, and likewise the scale factors. But in, in all this kind of stuff, we, we do have to do a bit of work around for, for the limitations of field quantified. And our last resource um, is to recognize things by name, and, and we are doing this for things like tensor or panic using things like tensor product data. And, and, Currently, discovering that a particular ensemble is no derivatives, it's just something that we recognize by name. And that's in, that could in many ways be seen as a deficiency of the interchange, but um, on, on the other hand, um, the, well, okay, in that case, it, it, it definitely is, but in, in the bigger picture, as far as the field of L is concerned, it's just producing numbers that depend on something else. So the, the, the field of L is, is none the wiser about what you intend to use it for. But something like no derivatives should be better marked up than that. So I just want to go through the um, the interchange issues uh, from the zinc perspective because I commonly work on the graphics side, um, and um, as well as helping the field of and, and wider project. So um, the pattern that we agreed on here is most different from the zinc data model. It's much closer to the iron model. So and, and the zinc internal data structures that were uh, designed some time ago and created essentially for visualization only. So I've had to do quite a lot of work to, to um, discover all these field templates from when they don't exist internally. And that's that's something that anyone who's going to interchange using a data model isn't exactly the same as their, as their own data model is, is going to have to deal with. Um, so that's taken a little bit of time. Um, that's the fact here. Um, so I mean, uh, I've had to fix some, some uh, issues with, with the way we've mapped parameters, which were, as I said, with the visualization only, but um, because we're, we're trying to interchange it in a way that the computation software can understand it, we um, we, we have to uh, discover the highest level description of how parameters are mapped, how the and so on. And we've, we've got to work through some deficiencies in the way we deal with scale factors. So um, you know, Chris and I are talking at the moment about um, how do we want to um, to describe scale factors and use them in the future. Um, so um, it's not just that we're in the field of mill, it's about sorting out our own you know, houses before we, we, we talk to each other. Uh, so read and write to work up all of these, putting the meat, uh, bases and derivatives and versions. Um, we, we, we set out to push on the Z side first because it's a bit more difficult, and then the field lessons learn and, and sort out the iron side. So we, we need to make a push on the iron side but also results some of those out. So, so these are the kind of models that, that um, you can um, interchange. This is a bifurcating pixel model. It's, it's all made up by algorithm. But um, it has some um, these arrows of different color of the different versions of, of the directions um, that the uh, emit element leaves um, the junction. Um, so it come, comes out here and there's two slight different angles there, but there's also a different radius on each side. So this is a test model for, for um, the versions and, and derivative mapping. Um, other models we have, uh, it's not actually quadratic, uh, uh, it's a typo there, um, I, I believe they're just linear, but this model has some um, hedra in the interior and it has hedra elements, so it's extruded triangles on, on the boundary layers in there. So we can already support having 
obviously different functions and different elements that we can we can also support, which I haven't shown here, having different functions per component. Uh, so here's just a, a list of the things we're still working on. Scale factors. Um, I am using some a large a monolithic um, vector for storing all the degrees of freedom. So it has yet another indirection between the node um, parameters to an array, uh, to, to a 1D array that contains the, um, uh, the degrees of freedom parameters. Per element of constants uh, is, is not a, you know, a lot of these things are, are kind of a couple of day kind of jobs, but they've, they've sort of been put aside to, to do some of the big picture items. Uh, data block fields, arbitrary tensor product bases. Um, Collapse spaces, we, um, we, we eliminate some degrees of freedom in the basis function to have simple bases or collapse some of the, the bases of, of um, elements and apexes. Um, multiple regions can be added, but it, it doesn't really limit our interchanges as long as we're not, we don't have interrelationships between regions. So. And we, we, we currently are not exploiting HDF5, we're just concentrating on getting the representation in there. But because we work with the FieldML API, we are isolated from, from that. So as soon as we start putting the data, the bulk data in this different form, we just can, get, can digest it straight away. And, and ultimately, we're, we're interested in getting things like general linear mapping and, and, and hierarchical refinement. Some of these are starting to push um, how you know, well they can be represented in the field of 0.5 data model. So we really do need to start making some improvements and, and, and go through a lessons learned kind of process. Um, so just some experience of using 0.5 um, from my point of view. It is able to represent our current models and it does it does deliver on efficient storage. So it's not it, it's um, in many cases it, it's it, well in fact it's usually smaller than the EX format that we have been using and it can be much smaller if we can put the bulk data in a binary storage. Um, it's um, one thing you learn is that it's it favors homogeneity in, in the representation. So it, it, it's some um, you can't, for example, chop and change between having you know, three integers and then a real number and, 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 and having look up this and look up that. It, you really, it really divides your model into um, homogeneous data structures. Like here are all my integers for looking up which element number I'm. Here are all my real numbers which say the coordinates within element charts. And, and, um, and, and that's, I think, is, is, is part of its design, and, and but it really does push you for certain representations. So some of the freedom to, to represent your model is actually, it becomes pretty obvious what the best way is to communicate with things. Um, we have we have to use some inelegant work around some mathematical operators. There's no, there's no map in the agent yet, but um, you can, with an external evaluator, just find, say, um, a, a binary product um, of real numbers, which which I will probably um, do in the, in, in the mean, in the, in the middle. Um, so but its biggest issue is it really lacks the high-level domain field of getting concept that we've been uh, exploring with the field of We've mocked some up and they kind of work, but it, 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 I think that it's extremely elegant without adding new features to, to the data model. Um, and, and now the final comment is that we have an API for working with it, and um, you do have to engage your end brain to work with it. And, and that's partly because there's this um, there's a lot of indirection needed to, to get the, the parameters through to your final interpolation. And, and whenever you add things like monolithic dot vectors and all these other clever ways of, of getting your numbers moved around, there's, there's, you know, you've got to add that add it in there. But added to that, the, the way field and works is that every evaluator has a type. Even the types have, um, well, and the, the, they're indexed by arguments, and arguments have a type. The type might be a real, the real might have components, and it just goes on and on. So you, you've got to think hard about have I got a, an argument or a type or, and so on. But it, it, it all kind of works in its own way. Um, but um, yeah, definitely don't want to be skipping through it. Um, so anyway, thank you. These are the links to uh, the things that all can feel the other one. Any questions? So, have you, let's say I want to write a field of our models tonight, I've got two tutorials up on fieldofnumber.org or how to But I probably wouldn't write it directly in XML. Uh, you, you could go and use the same API and create the model and then just export it. That sounds good. But again, is there a, 
Uh, there are some examples. I, I think they're probably not the best place to, to, to show you them. Um, you know, most of them are just kind of test examples that, that are not they're designed to test it rather than show you how to use it. So, so we need to do a better job of that. Um, but I think that um, it, it is quite complicated to represent some of the stuff. And, and I think it's pretty unlikely that it, it, it's not um, expected that you will explain to someone how to write the low level stuff. I, I could quickly show you what, what it looks like. Um, no, I cannot. Okay. Um, I can show anyone who's interested on my computer later. But it is it's just, it, it's a lot of XML stuff. It's kind of logical, right? But it's just quite wordy and, and looks like novel to do. So you you um, you really have to use the tool. And I know that's something I'm very often it's the tools, you know. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Can I have one last one? What's the, the meaning of uh, tested product if uh, the nodes have some features? I think you're trying to define tested products. So the, the tensor product basis is, is suppose I have a three dimensional element. Yeah, well, I mean, it's a, but those nodes, they might have features, right? Because uh, the nodes, I think you mean models. No, okay. So what we call a node in, in, in finite elements is just a point at which parameters are held. Right, it's a point in space. Okay, so it's not a, it's not a, you know, it's not a hierarchical okay. so, so don't be confused by that. Did you want to know what the tense product is? No, no, I know that. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, so in the seven before I was going to say, I was just going to quickly mention a few things that are going on that are again relevant to this community. So aware of what's going on. So the first is combined. Um, and again, you know, I saw these slides off the internet um, for at least one from Michael Huckett. Um, so thanks to him for that. Um, and I really do encourage everyone who's presenting to put your slides online. Um, it makes it really easy for me to get talks later on. Um, and if you do put them online, send me a link and I can add it to the program so that people can find them. Can find them. So firstly, very quickly, what is combined? It's not one of those. <laughs> um, so the idea is that you know developing these standards that some of us work on and others develop tools to support them, um, it's a very diverse set of skills that you need. Um, and you need to generally find a whole bunch of people that think the same to work on these. Um, and you need to sort of manage these things as you go along. So yeah, not just the standard, but also the software. Um, so I guess a few years ago now, um, there was a so we all knew that there's a lot of overlap in some of the efforts that are going on around the world, um, particularly you know XML, so and now um, and a few others, but they're all sort of independent um, and going on about things on their own way. Um, a lot of times they're you know, starting from scratch, doing the same sorts of things that they could just be reusing processes or documents from other groups. And it sort of got to a point where to keep up with all these various things, many people within the communities would be traveling non-stop to try and get all the meetings uh, to keep up, up to speed with them. Um, so the idea was born to create combined um, you know, computational modeling and biology network, um, what we call it the Hodo. Um, and the idea being to coordinate meetings, coordinate the standards development, develop some common procedures and tools, and to try and start providing a recognized voice. Um, so for the funding agencies or anyone who is looking for advice or help in some particular area can just come along at the sort of high level and gradually get put into the people that need to talk. So currently as it stands, there's, these are the, the, um, the core standards that combine this Firefox, Salmon, CDN, CML, Shitfall, the latest edition, and ZML. Then associated with the standards, you've got these associated efforts, um, so things like the, the minimum information, so, uh, Specifications that you might need, system biology on quality, the PCR on quality I mentioned before, um, biomodel qualifiers, 
why not go with it? You know, these are why is the law. Um, so this one is fairly huge um, and growing rapidly as a way to try and come up with unique identifiers. Um, and then as, as well as these, you've got a bunch of related standardization efforts. So these are generally standards that are still being developed, not quite so mature as, as these ones up here. Um, so you can see if you're now um, Euro and I'll be pretty close to moving to the, the top line. Um, and things like you can um, So we have two main meetings each year. Um, there's a combined meeting, which is sort of a workshop like this, and Harmony is a hackathon, um, which is actually next week in Germany. If you're in Germany, you've got nothing better to do. Come along, it would be great. Um, so there's also, as part of the sort of combined infrastructure, there's a way to, to um, have a common URI for different specifications. Um, and there's sort of this complicated way to go through it, uh, but it makes it sort of compatible ways to specify the different standards um, combined. The website, you see I'm currently one of the coordinators. So if you have any questions, feel free to ask. But yes, it's open to all, and as John said, you do. <laughs> so join the mailing list. If you have any opinions, voice them. You can better come along to meetings and go up to lots of them. <laughs> um, but if there's any quick questions, just shout them out. Do you have any representation or formal links with those associated standard codes? Like Sorry. Do you have any links, formal links with the other associated standards development organizations, like identifiers.org? Uh, so identifiers.org is essentially part of Combine. Um, and there's many people that are involved in that. Um, we are now starting to form links with some of the like ISO in the German DIN. I think it's called. Um, so one of the coordinators, Martin is quite involved in talking to the sort of standards committees within those real standards committees. Have okay, you talked to standards New Zealand uh, or some liaison and kind of support and stuff? No. Yeah. You can see me. Um, so, unfortunately, I couldn't find any slides to steal that was in my app. So I thought I'd just take you through the paper. Um, but mainly because there's a few pictures that are useful. Probably should have just joked that it is. <laughs> but that's the summary. Um, so, Martin mentioned it this morning. Um, so there's this effort to, to standardize essentially the file. Um, so for any piece of, of modeling work or a study or something, you want to create an archive that contains everything you need to, to some degree of everything, everything you need to re reproduce um, that piece of work. Um, so you can imagine, you know, you've got various Imaging data or something or whatever, you know, different um, XML documents in different formats, maybe some pretty pictures, um, annotations, PDFs, whatever, all combined into one archive and so you can just give it to someone. And then they can take that, extract out the information, hopefully understand what you did, and reproduce your results. And how this sort of thing ties in with some of the virtual machine stuff that Dan can talk about tomorrow. We heard a bit of that on Wednesday. Um, computer science um, will be interesting. Because this doesn't currently include the software that you use to run it. The idea is this is more a standard based thing, so any tool that understands the standard will work. Um, so there's two main things that are. Archive should have 
Ooh. Let's start playing. Um, so one is a manifest. And in the manifest, um, and the stack, so there's a standard for the OMEX, called the OMEX format, open, open modeling exchange format. Um, and then that it specifies that you should have this manifest file at the root level. That's not our data. Not that late. Um, so you should have this manifest at the top level of your archive, and that manifest defines the important things in your archive. So you're saying, you know, what a piece of content in the archive is, what its format is, you do this identify the all. Um, you are right, is it possible, or just a um, mind type if you need to? Um, I, so using the, the URI version of a mind type. Um, so that tells tools reading the, the archive, what's in there. Um, and there's also um, this attribute here, so master true, which can be specified by at most one of the content versions in the archive, and that tells the tool, which you have hints, when you load that into a tool, what they maybe should look at for the main file in that archive. Um, but of course, if you load this archive, maybe a XML model, or an HTML tool, and you say XML file is the main one, it might just choose to ignore that and load the XML. And then associated with that um, is this idea of a sort of minimal set of metadata that you want to specify about the archive. So things like who created it, when they created it, and things like that. And you know, linking maybe to the um, So this is now in PMR. If you have a manifest and you create an exposure, then it will give you an extra link to download it in one archive um, containing these from the repository. Um, how this all works in terms of versioning and things like that is still about in the air, um, but it's something being thought about and worked on. So if you're interested, there's a mailing list. Under combined for this topic, and you should join it. Any questions? Yeah, yeah, could, so could you kind of say that again? Maybe so there's, if you go to the sound level library, you just put a manifest file there. Yeah. It will do the right thing. I mean, what, is that, what does that mean to you? Uh, so essentially, in, so in the repository, you have a workspace, and a workspace contains a bunch of files. Right. And so you, I think you can have multiple manifests. You can have a little manifest, and when you create exposure, what you do is um, for that particular file, what the purpose of that as exposure, you specify the manifest file that goes for that particular file. So if you had, you know, so you might have a workspace where you have some amount models, you have a ML um, thing. And so you may create one archive that is, has the set of null file, and so if you want to reproduce the whole simulation, you can get. But you may also have a model that's, you know, a hierarchical model. So, file. so the way I think about this is that inside the repository, you have kind of directives that can take a bunch of files about the same yeah. file simulation experiment, right? Yeah. So I understand the standard is just a way of standardizing how you list the contents of that directive, right? Yes, but it's a snapshot of the contents of that directory. So it's time to uh, So it's when you create that zip file, it's, yeah. Okay. And so you can have version information in there. And so one idea is, I mean, you know, you can just include the bit information in there. Right. And, right. Time. and so then, for example, we talked about putting our annotation files in yeah. those directories. So that would be another entry in the manifest would say, same gen file, yeah. blah, 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 blah. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, cool. We can do that. Do you store the zip file in PMR or no. do you create it? They're generated by the file for that particular version. Yeah. 
Okay, so the last one. Quickly. Um, so numeral, numerical markup language. Um, basically, it's there comes the history of it is the, the system biology result markup language, um, and it's a sort of subset of that format. Um, so you want to standardize the exchange of numerical results, and you want to be able to reuse existing standards. And the idea is that we're using this as a way to get experimental data or any data in this system. So, so you know you, you have your model, you have software tools, you run different simulations, you get about the data, um, and you want to be able to manage these data. And so yeah, it's like a complex format. Um, but basically, it, it's the annual, you, you have these ontology terms um, to be able to define what different things are, and you define the sort of components of your data. Um, and dimensionality, um, you know, to then link through to the actual values, which but these are the sort of actual values that can then come from the underlying actual data um, So there's a Google Code project that's just moved um, to GitHub. So you should find it on GitHub now. Um, but essentially, it's, I don't think it's yet standardized on the first version of um, the object model. Oh, it's a we really should have looked at these before. Um, but there's the basic example. Um, so you've got a new file, you're defining these ontology terms. Um, to say you know, you've got terms that it's not necessarily all agreed on. But here you're saying you've got a term time um, that is this. So it's interesting in this we are ontology, this is the ontology, and concentration. So then later on, uh, you're saying things like, yeah, where well, you're linking back now to those ontology definitions for this particular variable. So again, saying you have time, and then um, linking through to that issue to define where it comes from. And you can essentially do that with an arbitrary number of things. And then, but it's really the most way as just common data if you actually put it um, in the new one directly. So there's a lot of stuff to link through to the specific SPML constructs because this has come from system biology um, originally. Again, there's a library, it's a library that you can use to access this. Um, and it's just it's you know just uh, just getting up and running. Um, it's not as active as some of the other areas um, of CML. Yeah, so, like sorry. Yeah. Is it used for expressing the the execution of the, the instance of a, of a model? So, so the original SPRML was here's the model and here's the data and here's how it's linked together. And so this is now taking the here's the data to separate that out somewhat. But some of the syntax is still tied back to previous. Um, so again, that the idea being that you have this sort of converter layer that then makes you talk to whatever format um, underneath. Currently, CSV is the only supported format. Um, but essentially, you know, this could include biosignal and now field and now or whatever. <coughs> yep, so there's a bunch of tools to do stuff. And again, all these links to Google Code that now, thanks to Google Code shutting down, have all moved to GitHub. So, 
um, if you want to if you want to get involved in this project, you want to. Thank you. Any questions? Can Sarah will be used as a substitution for your experiment? Is that the degree of the confidence? Like uh, it depends on your model. There, there are certainly people, especially in cardiac electrophysiology, that, that are using sort of cardiac cellular electrophysiology models in, in parallel to the real cells. Yeah. Um, like communication. So it's that you can measure the parallel, which means that maybe uh, the weight of uh, the real experiment can be sensitive. Oh, they reduced the um, yeah, I mean, so cell now is just a format for encoding a model, but doesn't necessarily mean that model is any good. If the, uh, the model has been evaluated, yeah, so if it's been peer reviewed and, and um, there's confidence, so those are the sort of annotations and metadata become important. So you want to see not just the model, but you want to see who created it, who's made changes, who's curated it. Um, and I think tomorrow we'll hear from Gary about some of their stuff in functional curation where you can see, you know, this model meets these protocols and so on. And so you can have some confidence that the actual model does what it should. Thank you. You saw the bio-signal I was saying, the last I see it's very young, but you know. Given that biosignal analog uses high density variety of high density data formats, such as HDF5 for the store, which would be the pro of CSV, do we need to start thinking about how the, the risk of biosignal analog maps onto your analog? Yes. I, I'm, I'm not. Necessarily in agreement that UML is the best way forward, but that's what the community has agreed on as being the standard interface between SCED and our data. So you, so you have a standard UML description, and that's what the CDML knows about and can talk to, and then how that talks to underlying data is, is a sort of tool issue. Yes, so. And it's not a lot different to what biosignal email is, but it's currently that's the standard way that this sort of communication is. And I think when you actually dive into numeral, it's also very, very similar to your data with some description. And there's other formats as well. So the idea is to have this consistent interface that then is what from CML that standard phase access you know, an array of values of data. Um, so this is a CAC file format. I have a micro consumer which can extend back to put other uh, types of data in there. So you can add stuff to the manifest if you want to put it in some yep. format. Yep. So, so if we can put a template and some scripts to build an execution environment in the yeah. right, right now. So, so we can just put those in and in theory it can be a situation where you could unzip the archive and the go and we'll build the execution environment something yeah. that needs to be fine. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, so I mean it, it is just a zip file yeah. um, with whatever you want in there. Um, and some way to describe it. The other one is being able to link to things that are not in the zip file. Yeah. So currently you have to link to only you can link to things in the zip file. But you obviously want to be able to link to Well, so I mean as far as the execution environment, so that that can be on the local machine or it can be up in a cloud or yeah. whatever yeah. you choose to use the same interview process. Okay. okay. So we should break for almost half an hour. We don't want to run too late. Um, so we'll maybe aim to start back. Um, yeah.
at about 20 to 4. And that should give us enough time before we go back to there. Okay. Thank you. And please, I'm not going to need to up.